<laughs> so let's go ahead and get started, folks. What's up, everybody? Um, really excited for tonight's discussion. I think it's going to be a really fruitful one. So like I said earlier, you know, there's still time. Invite your friends. You know, share this everywhere you can. We're going to get into some really deep topics. Uh, it'll be a great conversation. And just to introduce everybody, you know, my name is Cameron. I'm an organizer with the Claudia and Karina campaign. Uh, proud to be an organizer and happy, very proud, very happy to be joined by these three brothers who I've had the honor of building with in various struggles for justice at different times. So we got Eugene Perrier, an amazing journalist, author of Shackled and Chain, Mass Incarceration in America. What's up, Eugene? How you doing? Doing well, thank you. Happy to of be course. here. Of course. Excellent, excellent. We got Hiram Rivera, a longtime community activist from Philly, a founder of Black Men Build. Please welcome Hiram. How you doing? I'm good, brother. I'm a long-time organizer. I ain't no activist. I'm an organizer. <laughs> long-time organizer. Here we go. Yeah, yeah, and you yeah. heard it here, folks. You heard it here. Hiram Rivera. And last but not least, we got Dr. Jared Ball, an author and host at Black Liberation Media. Please welcome Jared. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Excellent. Excellent. So yeah, for everyone who's just joining this Instagram Live, you know, we got a lot of people in here. Really appreciate the comments, the energy. Uh, this is going to be a really pivotal dialogue, I think, where we are talking about the need for a new system. And we call this the two-party system has failed black men. So if you're feeling that, you know, leave a, a heart in the chat, leave something in the chat. And if you can't tell from the title, we're hosting this discussion for many reasons, but mainly because it's important to address the core of these issues facing black America, uh, particularly black men in this case, given recent news that we're going to go into and the structures of oppression that have been targeting us, of course. So I think we all agree, at least on this panel, or we can debate it, you know, that the two parties don't have a strategy for black working class people, um, as well as working class people as a whole. And even when they say they do, they don't meet the scale of the problem. So crisis after crisis, we've reached a point where millions of people feel like this is never going to end, like there's no way out, right? So we want to fight that, hopefully have some optimism at the end of the tunnel. But just in the past four years, I don't got to tell y'all, but we've seen the drastic impacts of so many crises from inflation, the cost of living, the impacts of COVID-19, a mass movement against police brutality and police terror, uh, the struggle for abortion rights, LGBTQ people's rights, as well as anti-genocide protests standing up with our brothers and sisters in Gaza, not to mention the effects of this climate catastrophe, which is disproportionately you know, affecting the poorest of our society. So these recent hurricanes, all of this kind of factors in. And all of us have been people who have organized under Democrat, Republican, any type of administration, uh, and once again, we're being told the only answer for black America is vote blue no matter who, right? So with that in mind, I just want to jump right in and hear from y'all, you know, what are your thoughts about the state of black politics, the black liberation struggle at today's crossroads? Right, let's go ahead. Maybe we can start with, uh, Dr. Jared Ball. Let's hear from you. Um, well, the state is pretty bad. I'm, I'll just start with the material conditions and they speak to, uh, the, 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 the horrific state of affairs. Uh, and um, so it, it is being reflected in the messaging around this presidential election in terms of just even the ability to uh, promote Kamala so relatively effectively as the Democrats are often able to do as an option for black people or any oppressed community suggests that the this, this state of affairs as it regards organization and political movements is pretty weak. Uh, um, so it's not for a lack of trying. Obviously, people on the screen here represent all, a, a lot of the great efforts being made, uh, but it's, it's, it speaks to empire's effective use of propaganda and psychological warfare on top of other, you know, techn technologies and weaponry. Uh, but to magnify these, a lot of false narratives around what is the potential for there to, 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 to be. And if anybody pays attention, particularly those of us who've had a, a few of election cycles under our belt, it's pretty clear uh, what the cycle is. Uh, and uh, as con things continue to devolve, we're, we're, we're faced now with yet again, again, for my life, lifetime, uh, my first real election in 1992, I've been hearing the same thing every four years. This is the most important election. Mm -hmm. It's a dire situation. Fascism's around the corner. Uh, you got to do this. It, you know, uh, it was vote or die under, you know, what's his name? You know, nobody wants to say his name anymore. You know, you know, it was, it, it was, it's, it's now, you know, uh, vote to save democracy. 
and he, we're, we're right back where we are. And yet the material conditions of the community is worse, is devolving. I mean, people, you know, have nothing. And that is somehow able to be used as an effective mechanism to encourage people back to vote for the very people creating that mess in the first place. So, um, yeah, so we just have to keep pushing and work to, to, to restore some of the, 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 the vigor in these movements and these organizations that we all are here in various ways representing. Uh, and those that we're not able to represent on the screen right now. Um, but yeah, it's, it's it's bad shape. We're in bad shape. As Daruba keeps saying, the home team, it's not looking good for the home team right now. Not looking good for the home team. I definitely feel that, you know what I mean? Um, let's go to Hiram. How are you feeling? Let's hear about it. Yeah, um, I think, you know, one one thing I want to correct is I, I'm a co-founder. One of the co-founders of Black Men Bill, definitely not the, 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 sole, the sole founder. Um, I think that the, the the state of politics for the 48 million black people in this country is at a state of crossroads. It, we are at a moment where, you know, the end, what my, what my brother Brandon calls the end of the colorless society, right? What was supposed to be brought, brought in with Obama. Um, the gains that were made since the civil rights movement in terms of like electoral positions all over the country, you know, uh, corporate positions, the, the growing middle class and upper stratas of, of the black population. Um, we're at the end of all that. And with that said, we have no institutions that represent the black nation, that represent black people. The, the, the traditional historical institutions of like the NAACP and those sorts of things do not defend black people. There are no institutions that speak to the issues and to the desires and to the concerns of poor black and working class people in this in this country. Um, I think that the black, you know, the black nation, as I understand it to be, doesn't have a leader. Right. There is no leader that you can point to who you can say that the 48 million black people recognize that individual as their leader, as the one who can articulate right, their concerns, the person who can articulate their hopes and desires, who can hold, right, uh, their interests, and then fight and advocate on their behalf with the state for those concessions, right, and for, for pieces. And so for the, the people for who five centuries at this point, and maybe more, whose blood, bodies, sweat, tears have built this country, built the wealth, and built the empire that we know as the United States, there has been nothing that has been given back, right? And I think that black people in this point in time are at a moment where really need to look internally and have internal conversations around what needs to be built, what needs to be done, right? What needs to be created in order to defend black lives, defend black people and fight for the interest, the material interests and needs of, of our people. Much appreciated, yeah. Absolutely, right on the on spot. So, uh, Eugene, what do you think? Well, I mean, you know, listen, I just have to concur with 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 my brothers here. I mean, you know, there's, it's maybe the be the most hopeful comment I'll take from this is, you know, it's always darkest before the dawn, um, but it's pretty dark in terms of what's happening. I think the Black Liberation Movement, you know, is at a total crossroads. I mean, you think about it like this. I, I was thinking about this earlier today. Um, the late Dr. Robert Allen's book, uh, the, the um, uh, Capitalist Awakening in Black America. And the, if you haven't read the book, the whole context of the book is that in addition to the things that are more known to, I think, many people from COINTELPRO, the assassinations and so on and so forth, you had this tremendous attempt to co-opt the radical energy coming out of the Black movement, you know, the Ford Foundation, so on and so forth. So here you, you fast forward to 2024. And I think in the same way we talk about how okay, you know, imperialism learned from Vietnam and they went to a volunteer army from the draft because they recognized the draft could be problematic. You know, they've heavily perfected this, I don't know what else to call it, nonprofit industrial complex. But how can you be, we've had the, 24, since 2014, we've had in 2020, the so-called uh, allegedly, I, and I believe it, largest protest movement in the history of the country in terms of people protesting. We've had multiple cities burn you know, in, in extraordinary ways, led by the youth, all these different pieces. I mean, the level of energy, like people forget in the middle of 2020, like from once George Floyd got killed to I think mid-July, maybe it was mid-June, like 20,000 people got arrested. Now I'm not saying those are all legitimate arrests, but it just gives you a sense like the high tide of resistance, police stations were burned down. I mean, all these different pieces. And yet and still in 2024, we have no institutions built out of that, no mass movement organizations, 
most of the groups in the sort of broader movement for Black Lives Space, I hate to say it, but I think we just have to say it, are either defunct, struggling, involved in major financial controversies, and none of that is an accident. That's what I'm getting at here, and that's why I started with the point about Robert Allen's book. They perfected this, and they executed a very profound counterinsurgency catch-and-kill strategy to try to prevent a renewal of the movement in this context. So I think we have to grapple with that as well as we're grappling with where we are in the sense that the, the levels of opposition, even to radical critique, has become more sophisticated, more well-funded, more directed at a higher level. And of course, there's more black faces in high places. So the possibility of seeming like you could do something within the system at least has sort of a, you know, eye test kind of, 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 of look to it. But yeah, I think, you know, I'll just close on saying this. If we don't center capitalism in a real way now, our conversation will never go anywhere. Exactly. I mean, in fact, nothing but facts in the words of Kwame Ture. I really appreciate that that opening and where y'all are at. Um, and I think what brought us together today, at least, is to talk about how the two-party system has failed. And I'm seeing the comments in the chat that I completely agree with that. It was built to be this way. It's been constructed and perfected, as we've talked about for a long, long time, of course. So. I, I definitely agree with that. And I just want to say the Democrats keep giving us the exact same thing, but they also love to manipulate. And I think we're going to talk a lot about manipulation today. The, the whole Joe Biden saying, if you don't vote for me, you ain't black, right? The, the whole fact that they defend themselves, right? And they say, well, Biden-Harris administration has given $17 billion to HBCUs in the past three years, right? What more do you want? Uh, Kamala's plan talking about empowering black men through so at least some of the key points that have hit the media is giving black entrepreneurs business loans, you know, opportunities to get into the cannabis industry and cryptocurrency, uh, a deeper study of sickle cell anemia. But many, many, many of the core issues that affect black people are going completely unmentioned, whether it's on the debate stage or in Kamala's plan, whatever it may be. So could, I mean, I'll pose this to any of y'all, but could you speak to these so-called solutions and also you know, what is the actual scale of the issues we're facing? You know, how is it not matching? Jared, please speak to crypto, please. <laughs> like, oh my God, I've heard so much of, please. I mean, well, the short of it is, it's like any other investment claim. There's no such thing as investing yourself out of poverty, uh, certainly as a collective oppressed community or nation. So, so um, I think crypto, so the, the crypto community has put in more than half of corporate investments into this election cycle on both sides. Uh, we covered this a little bit with my comrade Renee uh, today about some of her recent work exposing some of the advisors to Kamala Harris. Uh, was it Anderson and Horowitz? That firm is heavily invested, heavily right wing and conservative, heavily invested in cryptocurrency, but is now you know hanging out with her a little bit, and all of a sudden she's posting posting posing this as an actual solution specifically for black men. Um, when the realities are just like everything else, it's all the coins are accumulated, all the, the exchanges are consolidated, all of the uh, investment opportunity is already taken up by the billionaires who are just using black investors to boost their stock portfolio, stock value. And then we get the messaging from Kamala to Hill Harper to Roland Martin to John Hope Bryant to everybody saying investment in crypto is somehow a solution uh, to the to 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 black people and black men's portfolio problem. Uh, so it's just it, it's re re restyled, repackaged uh, propaganda, and none of what she's offering in these claims are. are a, anything different. We've been hearing about how often in these elections have we been hearing about the Democratic Party saying we're going to do this for the middle class. Mm. So they're acknowledging they're not doing anything for the poor and at the same time not acknowledging a class structure that creates a so-called middle class in the first place as if so then what about the what other, what other classes then then there do there exist madam future potential president um and and then we get a lot of if you're poor or if you are if you're in that middle class or not not doing well enough or if you're in within that middle class because they don't talk to poor people at all then you can invest in in housing or stock and now crypto uh to to again boost that portfolio problem that you have and then you don't have to worry about racism or class or capital or anything else and uh, uh so we're just getting more of that 
and it's because it was known also, I think, by the way, that uh, black people by percentage of investors were almost two times more likely to be investing in crypto to white investors. Uh, part of the mythology that was telling black people to invest your way to freedom is now being reframed by a future potential president as a policy plank to help those mm -hmm. people who have already invested and are being fleeced. It's it's hustles on top of hustles. Uh, and again, why I think we're all gathered is because these two parties are in collusion to to um, maintain that illusion. Yeah, no, I mean, it's a good point. I mean, you know, to the point about the middle class, I mean, which in and of itself is such a wild situation. But if you read the plan, um, which, you know, for whatever reason, I guess I, I hate myself, I did, um, you know, it says that it's all about, I mean, it's, it's what you want to hear like, rhetorically in some ways before you get to it, like good paying jobs, which I'm all for good paying jobs. No doubt about that more for black men. You know, I, I tried to run some rough numbers. Like it wasn't really as easy as I was hoping for um, on black male unemployment, labor force participation rate, which is a better way of looking at it. It's like 40% of black men are unemployed. Now the actual number, I, I don't even want to say the number on because we live right now and it was a rough calculation, but you know, it's, it's millions of people. And I did a little research into, um, you know, some of these other things like the Inflation Reduction Act, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act that they say are going to create all these jobs. Now, the best sort of scenario I could get from that um, is that it's going to create 3 million jobs a year, 3 million good jobs a year. Um, now, I don't even really believe that, but let's just say that's true. So if you break it down, like year by year, that's something like $200 billion a year. So you're essentially saying, uh, like, well, let me put it to you like, let me just put that aside. Nothing she's saying is at that level. So you're basically saying, okay, yes, we have the lowest ever black unemployment under Biden, which is like a hell of a thing to say when 40% of people are unemployed. Then you say, but I know some of y'all are still hurting, so I'm gonna try to give you good jobs. But then when you actually try to quantify it, you can see their entire approach is totally hollow. In fact, the whole plan has no mention. The only like number of jobs it mentions creating is it says it'll open up 500,000 federal jobs that currently require a bachelor's to people without a bachelor's. So black people without a bachelor's can compete with every other person without a bachelor's for these 500,000 federal jobs. Like that's it, but we need millions of jobs. And we're not even talking just about uh, black, uh, black people, we're talking just about black men. And I think that's the other factor, and I know we'll get into this. I mean, you know, you look at, I wrote it down because I wanted to get this right, because um, it kind of just blew me away, uh, the number of unemployed folks. So between the ages of 20 and 24, right, young people trying to get a job, trying to get established, the so-called people who they say, like, college isn't for everyone, right, so you need to go right into a job who the good jobs would be for. Well, amongst black men, you have 14.4% unemployment of people 20 to 24. Amongst women, it's 13 and a half percent. So as much as the whole conversation is being directed like, oh, black women love Kamala and black men don't, you can see that whether we're talking about black women or black men, that there is nothing being proposed that is meeting the scale. There's no $200 billion employment plan for black people, but yet and still, they still can sit here and tell you, if you vote for us, we're gonna have good middle-class jobs for black men to you know, build your family and have your house in the suburbs, blah, 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 blah. I think when it comes when it comes to the Democrats and it comes to the two parties, right? We have to understand that these are instruments of ruling class domination. They always have been and always will be. Um, I look to W. E. B. Du Bois's piece, which was "I Won't Vote" in 1956, mm. right? And for those of you um, definitely look at that. I mean, it is incredible everything that he says, right? That he is not voting for the lesser of evil because there are no two evils. It's just one evil. Right, it's one capitalist evil. He talks about how he wants to vote for third party and that those elections for those voting for third party will often be dismissed as communists. He asked the question that what has been done? What has the current administration at that time done for the overwhelming masses of poor black people at that time while they're sending millions of dollars abroad for war to support apartheid in what then was referred to as Rhodesia in South Africa, right? And it's alarming that we are back here again in 2024 dealing with the very exact same thing. And so when I think of the two parties and I think of, of the pandering, right? The, the wicked, uh, wicked counter-revolution 
that has happened post that revolutionary period of the 60s and the 70s, right? The misappropriate misusing of this framing of our black grandparents, black great grandparents dying for the right to vote, right? When we know they didn't die for the right to vote, they died at the hands of violent white supremacy. That is why they died because violent white people and this government couldn't see black people living their lives, didn't wanna see black people prospering. That is why they died. And so I think of, again, the Black nation today being Bobby Seale's birthday, mm. right? Today being National uh, Anti-Police Brutality Day mm. and also the, the, the National Day Against Cop Cities, right? I think about what this government and what these two parties are preparing for. They never have had the interests of poor and working people, be they Black, be they Asian, be they whoever, be they white, in mind, nor do they have it now. They do not have the capacity nor the desire to meet the needs of the overwhelming masses of people who fall below, right, so-called middle class, whatever that is. They understand that the crisis of capitalism is inherent, it's always going to happen, and that for the masses and the swaths of people, we're talking about Black people today, specifically Black men, right, out of the 48 million Black people who, if you just take in numbers, right, because we keep referring to them as, as a Black community, you are talking about a nation of people that would be the 32nd largest country in the world. There are more black people in this country than there are people in total in Spain, in Venezuela, in Canada, with all the nuances, all the class differences, cultural differences, religious differences, language differences that come inside of a nation, inside of this settler nation. And so, so you know, I think of, well, what then does liberation look like under this system? And we know that it's not gonna come through the pandering of the Democratic Party, who at this point guarantees nothing to black people and has never guaranteed anything to black people because the way that the brothers at the leaders, uh, leaders of a Beautiful Struggle in Baltimore frame it so accurately, it's a captured electorate, right? Lawrence and Devon is a captured electorate. They're gonna come out regardless because what other options do they have? When I just mentioned, there are no institutions for black people. There is no black leader, right? That the 48 million people have anointed, have acknowledged and have said, this is our leader who holds our interests or our leaders. And so they have no other option but to fall in, in line with the Democrats. But we know, right? As I say that we are beyond, we are beyond the victors of that civil rights movement. We have hit the pinnacle. We had a president. We may very well have another president. We have Supreme Court justices, mayors, senators, governors, everything and still nothing for black people it is a moment in time where we have to start looking inward and having really hard conversations with ourselves around what needs to be done what needs to be built to pull us out of this babylon and so i think back of uh, again of this concept of nationhood and self-determination for black people and the the the, the black belt thesis the whole concept of, of the Republic of New Africa, free to land, right? To all those who identify as, as, as New African who understand our, our identity as New Africans, right? But this goes back to Claudia Jones, who says that ultimately the fight for self-determination for black people and to rid ourselves from the invisible chains of poverty and the legal chains of debt slavery, to, to quote her, comes through the struggle for socialism against capitalism and white supremacy. And it's high time that we as a people, as a nation, start really wrestling with that in a very real way. Capitalism cannot, will not, never has bring liberation, bring stability for the millions of black people, especially when black people, enslaved black people were the capital in capitalism. It, it does not exist without the, cons the, the, the consuming of black bodies and black labor. And so for those of us, right, who are on this side of, of, of the political coin, as well as everybody else, we need to figure out what needs to be built in this moment. What is the alternative to capitalism? Our ancestors knew that from Du Bois to Queen Mother Moore, to Malcolm, to, to Dr. Muhammad Ahmed, Thomas Sankara, right, uh, uh, Kwame Ture, and the list goes on and on and on and on and on. We have to fight back against that 50 years of counter-revolution that we've been living in, that counter-insurgency that we've been living in since the days of Bobby and Huey, to bring back, right, the lessons of Paul Robeson, the lessons 
of, of, of Robert F. Williams, of all, all those, of the Claudia Jones, of all those individuals to really wrestle with what does it mean? What does it mean to be black under capitalism in this white settler nation? And that's, that's gonna take us, again, building institutions. It's gonna take us getting into those communities, building with the poor and working masses of black people who have been ignored for so long. Even those of us who identify as activists and, and, and you know, organizers and all this stuff, right? A lot of times we approach and look at, at our community with this air of elitism because of all the books that we've read, because of the cool nonprofit jobs that, that we work at, right? In a movement for the past 10 years that was built to protect in the name of black lives. But one of the mandates was for brothers to fall back to shut up and listen in over correction of the wrongs that were done during the 60s in regards to the roles of women and marginalized identities in over correction and then just totally silenced and pushed brothers away and completely pushed them out. A nonprofit industrial complex funded intentionally by philanthropy that makes as a, as a, as a nonprofit director, I'm telling you as a nonprofit director, the amounts of millions of dollars that goes to women led things or black women this or black women right that sort of thing that then push brothers aside which is how i become a co-founder of black men build in 2019 when the very movement itself fearing again the same trope that brothers are going to go vote for donald trump which we know brothers ain't vote for donald trump all those brothers who sit in here i'm gonna vote for donald trump don't vote Nobody votes more Democrat, you know what I'm saying? Black women won, black men too. But the scapegoating of brothers, the scapegoating of brothers, to blame brothers for, for, for whatever Republican comes into office, and but you're not looking at those white women who roll in droves to go vote for Donald Trump. You're not talking to those white people who roll in droves to vote for Donald Trump. You're not looking at the Democratic Party who cannot put a, a, a solution, a clear platform, a plan that people can get behind and vote for. You have a, a, a presidential candidate who got the nomination and had no platform and was like, yo, just vote for me yeah. off GP. They voted Barack Obama two times and got nothing. And got nothing. The people are tired. And you can't keep blaming and scapegoating brothers for the failures mm -hmm. of your process, your administration, your government, because it was wretched from the start this babylon was wretched from the start there's nothing good that is built off genocide and enslavement nothing and so with black people we need to go back to the source we need to go back to our lessons that our ancestors left us and really think about what is it that we need and needs to happen in this moment in time what are the institutions that we need to do to build and get in those communities and talk to those people who so many of us turned our backs on who don't want right the majority of activists that you had that come out of this movement i end here in this last movement as an organizer i do i run organizing training for our george jackson school right right have to go back and reteach people how to talk to their community members because we are led and had movements and organizations nonprofit organizations led by black people who don't like black people Black people who don't feel comfortable with black people. Black people who, who can't spend two minutes with that type of black people. Mm. Right? That was the whole, the whole thing. The whole thing. Nuck if you, I remember, nuck if you buck, nuck if you buck. But you don't like nuck if you buck ninjas. You ashamed of them. We got to get back to that. We got to get back, back to that and build those institutions and build that leadership. 50% now, I'll for real end with this, 50% of black people right now in this country are 48 million. Almost 50% of them are under the age of 30 years old. Mm. Young pe people, they're talking about me and you, Cam, under 30 years old. That's funny. Wow. There was a, yeah. another no, generation that. of folks. That's what that is. <laughs> Wow. Don't let him get you. There's, there's another generation. There's another generation who is coming up and who is witnessing genocide, 
who's witnessing wars their whole entire life, who, who already are living in debt, whose college degrees already mean nothing before they have already graduated middle school. And the best you can do is roll out lanky ass Barack Obama to come talk shit to you yet again. It's high time. It's high time we start looking inward and start figuring this out. 100%. I mean, I told you all this was going to be a great discussion. So I know I see everyone's enjoying it. I mean, but these are serious topics. These are these are the real problems facing our community. And how different is this from the Democrat Republican debates we've seen? I mean, it, it just goes to show that there is absolutely nothing connecting this to uh, what's being discussed as the major problems of black people on those stages. So let's dive into this, especially the topic of black leadership, misleadership, the need to go back, study our movements, study our history. Um, a lot is being made, you know, of this fact that there's a recent New York Times poll. I'm just going to cite some of those stats. A lot of it is obvious right now, of course. But, you know, Kamala is the pick as of now, based on this poll, uh, for 70 percent of black men, 83 percent of black women. Meanwhile, Trump being the choice for 20 percent of black men, 12 percent of black women. You know, and at the same time, there's major dissatisfaction. Uh, and out of all of this discussion comes Obama, uh, who all of us are familiar with at this point, but who I think we stand to study a lot more about in order to actually understand the root of where he comes from, what he represents, and where he's trying to lead black America. So for those who maybe haven't come across it, you know, I went back and watched the clip today, and Obama's in this room of black men, black women, black people, but aiming at black men, saying the choice is very clear. You have one person who's basically a racist, Donald Trump. And you have another person who grew up like you, uh, someone who went to school with you, someone who understands your struggle. She's like, uh, Obama's saying, Kamala's just like your mother, just like your sister. And he's saying it's actually unacceptable for any black man to make excuses. Uh, and he's basically saying behind anyone not voting for Kamala is someone who doesn't want a black woman to be president. So there's a lot to discuss here, but I really want to open it up and again hear you know, I, I want to hear people speak to Barack Obama's comments, but more of what he's implying uh, about black men and black women in the society. And what's he really missing in this equation that is, you know, very much twisted. It's a twisted form of this, you know, feminist narrative, but it's trying to basically push people to support imperialism and the genocide. Uh, that is a very global one. So I would love to hear from you all on this question. Mm. What? Yeah. Well, Derek, I mean, go ahead. no, no, I, I just wanted to jump in as one of the 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 um, four under 30 year olds on this this <laughs> panel this evening uh, representing the youth. I just wanted to speak for my my youth, my, my black youth. Right. Um, yeah, you know, you know, um, he's so so if I don't know if I heard you correctly, but just 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 to be clear, Obama's not confused. He's not doing anything uh, new. He's not uh, unaware of what's happening. He knows exactly what has been going on. And when you talk about looking into his his where he comes from, where he comes from most in terms of most importantly for this moment is the Democratic Leadership Council and their offshoots, the Clintons and the Clinton machinery that has been vetting him since the early 90s. Uh, that's where he comes from, looking for that one that, as I think in one of Paul Street's books, he's black, but not civil rights black, was the language at these wine and cheese parties that, that they were hosting for him in, in Chicago back in the day. Um, so this is, this is in part what he was brought in to do, to both represent symbolically the, the conclusion of black struggle and strife, but at the same time, be a spokesperson for the white, well, all of the, all, all of the elite leadership, but certainly the white liberal and, and conservative uh, ruling circles, uh, the cabal that they form to tell black people, to, to put black people in line. So, I mean, he used, how, how many times did he use his presidential pulpit over those eight years to chastise black people and black men in particular having the nerve to go before black men and tell them that basically that, that they're poor parenting and pants and he did the whole bill cosby thing even you know for for a minute there just you know it's you sagging your pants and and not taking care of your kids that's the never once of course doing what any honest leader would do which would be to say well since this party has has had its 
repeated turn in power for cent- you know century and a half and it's done as Hiram has in everybody has laid out already done nothing for you um it it's we understand the logic behind your your refusal to vote at all or vote for us or you know certainly vote for a Hillary and now vote for you know, you know but they don't do that. They just continue to say, and as we continue to do nothing, as Kamala has come out and said, I'm not doing anything for black people in particular other than setting in motion the rising tides after that will benefit you once I once everything trickles down from everybody else, I'm going to end up helping in that middle class, vague, you know. Uh, but even though they can say that, they can still turn around and say, but how dare X percent of you say you're not voting for her? And to, and then to turn it into a, a condemnation of of black men against be, being against black women. This is absurd. It doesn't play out in any area of life where black men are, are so opposed to black women that they wouldn't vote for a black woman. How many black women have been elected in black communities already? I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. It's just, but it, but it's not meant to make any sense. It's meant to take up time from young folks like us who gather to talk about these things, to 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 and to just to to take up as much time and air away from whatever we should be talking about, which is building alternatives and movements and and walking away from that party anyway. So I wish he would show up somewhere around where me and my fellow youth hang out and tell us it's our fault. That we we are that that his party isn't getting everything that it wants. I wish he would turn up around where I'm hanging out with my fellow youngins and and uh, yeah. no, but seriously, it's it's just absurd all the way around. He knows exactly what he's doing. No, he does. He, he does. And let me just quickly fact check myself. Sorry, the labor force population ra- uh, ratio unemployment amongst black men is thirty percent, not forty percent. Still pretty bad. But you know, I just want to get the facts right oh, we, since we're saying that. You can just go home then. I didn't know. Yeah. I mean, I, it's all good then. It's only thirty. <laughs> but Peace, no, everybody. You, you, you're making a good point. The other thing I'll just say, also to Jared, in terms of where people show up, I saw someone point this out online a couple of weeks ago, so I started paying close attention to it. These barbershop conversations that everybody on both sides, Democrats, Republicans, this person pointed out they were like, you know, everybody is in the shop. You know, they, they got the apron on the bib with the whole thing, but it's no hair on the floor. So it's like just everything about it is so canned. They want to make it seem like, oh, yeah, black people, you know, like like all people. Yeah, we get our hair cut. Um, and like we went in the barbershop and we did our thing. If you just wanted us to sit around, like, why not just have it in a regular venue? Like it just I, I know that's an aside, but it just feels to me like the level of maybe just of like fake performativity uh you know lennon used to say about the u.s elections that um you know there's so little difference between the two major parties they have to have these great spectacles and i've been thinking about that so much this year because things like these barbershop conversations what obama's saying like it's also clear i mean you know trump with the shoes i mean trump even coming out to many men in one of his rallies after he got shot i mean just like so many it's just like what is going on the the democratic national convention um little john i mean like the fact you even thought that was relevant is uh, honestly showing me how out of touch you are like yeah that's really going to move a lot of votes so anyway just like the the hot like the the there's a correlation i guess is what i'm really trying to say here between the hollowness of the politics that's being given to the black community and the level of performative representation we're being given and the level of performative representation is going up as our actual condition in society is going down i mean we're living in a situation where right now you have 66 percent nearly 67 percent of black households telling the census bureau that they're finding it at least a little difficult to make ends meet every single week and i think it's like a fifth of black people finding it very difficult uh you know we're in 2024 however many years after slavery however many years after uh jim crow and the bet it, even like the the top people doctors lawyers whatever are making like forty thousand dollars less than their white counterparts so like the best they can do is significant inequality even if you're at the top of the heat forget being at the bottom and 54 percent of all black people make less than fifty thousand dollars a year so like what is obama missing uh you know I, I don't know if he's missing anything i think jared's point is, is to the point he's doing this deliberately but what is he leaving out 
is all of this context and all of these facts. He's creating a fake reality about how much progress has actually been made and then saying, how dare you not recognize that progress without actually recognizing that progress is at best skin deep, like at best skin deep. And as to the point of, you know, she's like your, your mom, this, that, I mean, my mom is an AKA, but I feel like very confident my mom, my sisters, my aunts, my nieces, my cousins, like all the women in my family, I feel very confident that they are not in favor of locking people up because their kids didn't go to school. So she's actually not like the black women I know and in my life. Uh, and I think that's probably true for most of us because most of us aren't related to cops and district attorneys and others because most black people who even go into the legal profession deliberately don't want to do that because we are being so disproportionately criminalized and hunted. And even if you look at the context of what she's saying um, in the issue of I'm gonna protect black men, she has the nerve to say that Trump had the lowest level of clemencies at the end of his term. Well, Biden is on track to have a lower number than, than uh, uh, Trump. Like Trump, I think, responded about, granted 2% of clemencies. So far, Biden has uh, granted 1.6% of clemencies. Jimmy Carter granted 21% of clemencies. And Jimmy Carter was considered to be a racist when he ran in 1976, right? That's what Andrew Young said. He may be a redneck cracker, but he's our redneck cracker. So, I mean, he and he's doing 21%. So she's even saying this at the time that her own administration is not taking care of business. And even when you look at the context of uh, violence and eruption, which has become bigger in our communities, thankfully, uh, to use non-police forms of stopping violence. Well, if you really study it, most of the most effective programs of community violence intervention are not dealing with the cops. But the way she writes it into her program is she's like community violence programs that work with the police. So you're already sort of building in that the only way to be considered a legitimate actor on how to address uh, crime, quote unquote crime, let's say community violence in our communities, is to just like pre-associate with the cops uh, and to assume they are an institution that has you know the best uh, uh, interest of black people in mind and at heart. And it just feels like, you know, you, the other part of it, I'm sorry, I'm ranting here, but it's, it's wild to me. Like we're gonna encourage people to, buy, to hire more black cops. I lived in Southeast DC. I lived in Baltimore. I live in the Bronx now. Like all the cops, they're not all black, but like, most of them are, and they'll still shoot you, beat you, run you down, extort you, treat you bad, lie about it. I, I mean, it's like, and anybody who knows, knows. Like, that's not like a secret. So the fact that it's even in there shows how much disrespect they actually have for you, that they just assume you're not going to know any of these points. And Trump, I mean, I, I've already gone on so long about, you know, <laughs> I don't even know what to say. Let me just say this about Obama and, and we can move, move the discussion a little bit. We, I don't even know, we might have to go longer than an hour, but um, now I'm getting excited, right? Uh, the other factor about this black men versus black women, the trend is the same. If you compare Biden in 2020 to where Kamala is at in the polls right now, it's 11% drop in support amongst black women. Now it's higher amongst black men, it's 18%, but the trend is the same. So the whole idea that like, oh, black, as Obama said, he said, oh, y'all just not feeling a sister uh, as a president, blah, blah, blah. Well, it seems like a lot of black women aren't feeling it either. And that probably is a consistent thing. And it's probably all of the same, you know, uh, feelings on both sides of the fence. So I feel like we're almost having like this, this, this fake narrative being created. And you can find some truth to it if you want to like isolate certain poll statistics. But when you tend to look there's not that much difference. There's maybe a, some more black women, a few percentage points supporting Kamala over black men, but it's basically the same. And the trend of decline is 100% consistent, you know, not only just across gender, but across age, especially young people. And to your point, Hiram, and I'll close on this, when we think about what do we really need to build, I mean, as all under 30 people here, uh, let's go with, what people under 30 told the New York Times in that poll that you quoted at the start of your question, Cam, 82% said that the economic system in the country either needs to be majorly changed or torn down entirely. 82% of black people under 30. I think that's a pretty good place to start if we want to talk about how we move beyond you know, Kamala, how we move beyond Trump. That's why I'm voting Claudia and Karina uh, this year because that, that's who I see is really doing the most to talk about like, let's seize this capitalist system as an emergency and let's actually use the human and material resources we have to solve our problems rather than just sit on our hands. 
Right on, right on. I mean, I agree with all that. The, the, the one thing, the one thing I'll add on to that with the, the Barack Obama, Barack Obama's role is always to come on and give a verbal spanking to brothers. And Barack Obama's claim to fame was his oratory skills going back to the Democratic Convention of 2004, where everybody fell in love with him, right? But we don't remember the 2008 Father's Day speech where he talked about how Black men were absent fathers. He talked about how Black men shouldn't be um, so mediocre that they would celebrate their, what was the quote, uh, eighth grade graduations, right? That you shouldn't be proud, like graduating eighth grade, right? That he talked about Black men being absent fathers. They talked about Black men feeding their children uh, cold chicken and, and, and drinking eight cans of, of soda in the morning, right? In a Black church on Father's Day. Barack Obama's rolled out again because the belief and the idea that people will still be entranced by his wonderful oratory skills that at this point have just become the ramblings of an old man, right? Going on and on about random stuff, trying to be funny, right? To again, give another verbal spanking to brothers who again, vote in line with his party, almost on par as black sisters do more so than any other group of, of, of men in this country, right? The constant infantilizing of black men that goes all the way back to the days of the antebellum, right? The, he, he might as well just been up there and call him boy at that point. And then you have all of these performative things of the barbershop conversations and all these different talks that folks are doing with black men and how you feeling and what's going on to defend the humanity, right, of black men. I'm not here to defend the humanity of black men. I want to get back to the power question, to the black power that those brothers represented, the black power that those sisters represented. Because that is what this is all about, is, is, is moving the focus onto, excuse me, um, these, these notions of character, of moral character, and not a question of power. Because politics is transactional. Politics is all about power. Huey Newton said, right? The ability to define phenomena and make it act in a desirable manner. That is Huey. And so, so with those brothers, the 20%, the supposed 20% that said they're going to vote for Donald Trump, right? Or that they're not going to vote for Kamala. That alone, in a disorganized way, not in any organized way, moved the Democratic Party and the state to some form of concession. What are you gonna give us? Pandering happens in politics all the time. That is the give and take. You want our votes, what are you gonna give us? And they demonstrated power unknowingly and unintentionally in a disorganized way by just saying 20% of us, we're gonna fill out this form and say we're voting for Donald Trump. I guarantee most of those brothers are not even gonna vote come election day, but it moved them. And so we need to think about that. If that's all it took to get them to roll out Barack, to get them to do all these things and come out with a plan as half-assed as it was, imagine what is possible in an organized fashion. Imagine what is possible when you build institutions that are solely, solely concerned with the priorities of Black people in this country. And it's not to fall into the nativist thing that is happening, right? There's this sort of like reactionary thing with black incels and the manosphere and, and all of these things and the different war, diaspora wars and all that or whatever. Let's put all that to the side because that is a, is, is a consequence of political underdevelopment due to the destruction and defeat of our revolutionary organizations from the 60s and the 70s and the counter-revolution and the counter-insurgency that has been happening. We have a lot, a lot of work to do, but we are up to the task and history has shown us and has proven to us that we are up to the task right and so barack obama can say whatever he wants to say we know the truth about black men in our communities we know that black men are excellent fathers we know that black men are excellent family members we know that black men suffer some of the same issues that everybody else faces under capitalism right we know that 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 black men are facing serious, serious levels of, of, of mass incarceration. But even among that, we know that black men are willing to sacrifice for their families, 
even when they don't have the material means to provide everything for their families, there are enough brothers out here who are willing to sacrifice what they have for their families, for their community, for their well-being. We need to create the institutions, the institutions and the spaces for those brothers and those sisters and everybody else to join in and really create a, 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 a Black platform, a Black politic and fight for the self-determination of black people, be it in the land with New Africa or be it all over this country. Because to wrap up with this, we also understand that given the population size of black people, this is including all black people, not just, not just uh, 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 so-called African-Americans, right? All black people, because the size of the population and where black people sit on this social hierarchy, economic hierarchy, serve, and can serve as a detonator for revolution in this country. And we have allowed liberals, we have allowed the state, we have allowed the Democratic Party to be the only ones who's talking to them and providing nonsense to them because no one else is doing that. We need to be real and have those courageous conversations within our community with each other, acknowledge the very real differences that exist within the diaspora, not as a way of separating us, but of understanding each other, what caused so many of us to leave our home countries to here, and understand what that struggle of those black people who are born and raised in this land, right, have had to go through and have had to deal with. Because those are very real. And when we understand those about each other, then we can put into context what is our collective experience in this Babylon we call the United States of America. Because time, time is up. What else is there? We already had a president. We already have Supreme Court. What else is there? And we're still stuck in the mud. Nah, it's time for a new day. It's time for something new. And this is what they fear. And if they think Barack Obama giving you a tongue lash is going to stop that wave, it's not. And they know that, which is why they're building so many cop cities, because that wave is coming. That wave is coming. And the day of reckoning is coming. The haves can no longer right? Stay away from the have-nots. And somebody has to pay for the living conditions that, that we face. Somebody has to pay for why my grandparents live in poverty the way they do. Somebody has to pay for all of those folks of our people who are suffering uh, uh, under sickle cell and diabetes because of the trash food that we eat and the no access to health care. Somebody has to pay for all the schools that they closed in Chicago and they closed in Philadelphia. Somebody has to pay for all of the lives that have been taken away from the police, the most of them under Joe Biden, the most money given to police under Joe Biden. Somebody has to pay for the violence that is happening to our brothers and sisters in the South under those Republican governments. Somebody has to pay for that. And they will pay for that. They will pay for that. And they know it. 100%. I mean, absolutely. I, I really appreciate hearing from y'all and when it comes to that, you know, the Barack Obama discussion that we started with there, I mean, I think it's super important to have because when you look around, if anyone, you know, by the misleadership and by the, the corporate media is called the leader of Black America, they might point to Barack Obama. But at the end of the day, hearing from y'all as people who have been organizers throughout his entire, you know, time as president uh, and then watching the post-Obama years where he still comes out just to condescend and attack Black people, attack people, uh, and fear monger, you know, hearing that whole perspective, I think is very important, especially for young, young people. Uh, and I, I know y'all are young, but, you know, being a child when Obama was first elected, uh, all I remembered at that time was the absolute racist, you know, vile bigotry from the Republicans against him, uh, and how good people felt that there was a black president. But I think we're speaking to a very similar theme. Um, and this is kind of where I want to take the conversation as I think we approach this hour, is there's all sorts of distractions and sources of confusion, Barack Obama being one of them, of course, and the top Democrats, uh, the Republicans, the media, the role they play. But there's also many other ways that people are influenced. I mean, I've seen in the comments, people are bringing up Dr. Umar, people are bringing up Charlemagne, The Breakfast Club. Uh, people might have seen their horrible political takes in the past, however long they've been around. But uh, you know, the DNC also taking this very strict approach toward influencers being at the DNC. Um, 
we talked about crypto, black capitalism. There's all these different things meant to tell people radical, progressive, socialist, any type of action that doesn't fall within the system is not going to work. Um, and all this misleadership has definitely resulted in many things. You know, some people who are die hard for the system, some people who honestly are feeling nihilistic, like nothing's going to ever work out. I'm going to just make it and care about myself because that's all you can really do in this society. Uh, but it's also created people who are socialists, who are the grave diggers of the system. Um, and now that we're at this point of reaching the end of what representation with no liberation can bring, um, that doesn't mean that organically the system is going to fall out of power, right? It doesn't mean that naturally it's all going to fall apart and we'll just walk in and have power. So I want to ask and raise this question from your perspective, you know, for all the nihilism or the we can't do it attitude and you know the this very purposeful cynicism about transforming society i want to ask you know what do you offer people who are watching about the path toward not only defeating the two-party system which is one aspect of it defeating capitalism and winning black liberation uh what do you offer for those who maybe don't think it's possible today okay can, can i jump in i don't want to keep having the last the last words i'll let these brothers do it very quickly Baba Chokwe Lumumba said, if you don't love the pe people, you will betray the people. Right? If you don't love the people, you will betray the people. Get into those communities and build those relationships with our people. Start talking to them. Why do the influencers have the influence that they have? Because nobody's talking to our people. Nobody's talking to our young people. Nobody has that patience to, to, to work with them and struggle with them. The language is not going to be perfect. The politics is not going to be perfect because we're dealing, like I said, with decades of counter-revolution. But struggle, if you love the people, you're going to have that revolutionary patience to struggle with the people, work with them, build those institutions, build those black parties, build those black organizations, and struggle against this capitalist system, and let's bury it once and for all. Mm. Yeah, because uh, 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 I definitely don't want the last word, but uh, the the... So I agree with that. Um, the first thing, you know, my, my, as I say all the time, my, my greatest sustained engagement with black youth are in my classrooms. And I get uh, a steady stream uh, because I'm on that HBCU 4-4 life. I get a steady stream of 100 plus students every semester, almost all of whom come from uh, mostly the black American, but the African diaspora working class. And many of them express their form of nihilism and pessimism as uh, black capitalism and black entrepreneurialism and fantasies of individual, uh, uh, relatively material, relative mat individual relative material success. Um, but I, so, but I, and my method has become largely not to chastise, but to encourage that they confront those feelings, recognize those feelings, be honest with those feelings, and then try to teach them that what they're dealing with is what Fanon referred to as the colonial inertia. Uh, this is not, not to, this is not, as we're often encouraged to believe, some failure of of black culture or 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 mentality or whatever. It is the it is the inertia of oppression that pushes people. And then the, 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 again, the pessimism is, is, is expressed in, to me, the pessimism is not when someone says I'm not voting, uh, um, or I'm even going for mine. That's maybe a form, but it's not as bad to me as when they, when I'm told, no, I'm voting for the lesser of evil. I'm voting for, in this case, Kamala, because I don't really know, because I feel like I'm supposed to. And I'm just trying to focus on, I just want to, you know, I just want to cast this vote, get my degree, get my diploma, get my job, hopefully get my mama a house. I mean, it's the same, it's the, that's it. And when you add, the more I ask every semester, what do you want? The res responses over the years, I felt I, I should track it scientifically. The responses have gotten more and more uh, um, pessimistic and individual. All of the, you know, my people should be free. Destroy, none of that. None of that. It's all, and this is what happens. This is the colonial inertia. So much like what Hiram was just saying, I just encourage them again to, to address that and recognize that that's, that's an intended response of a colonial oppression. 
and then to find ways to to inspire them to join organizations to think differently and to not be afraid of breaking both intellectually and physically with what the society wants them to do. And I think, think um, yeah, but I agree. I do, I do like the point that we have to, that those of us who claim to already be in these political spaces, intellectual spaces, we have to do more to build all of these, these entities that can bring these people in and show folks that they have uh, much more power and, and uh, much more to offer than just being grist for an electoral mill. Yeah. No, I think that's all right. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a hundred percent in agreement. I, I mean, you know, we're living in a context that, you know, the, the collision between expectations and opportunity, you know, I mean, we're, we're dealing with 40, 50 years of extreme counterinsurgency, total destruction, and then a propaganda apparatus that pumps out that the way to be successful, like when people say failure of black culture, and that drives me crazy. It's a failure of capitalism. I mean, it's the capitalist culture that says get rich or die trying, not black right. culture. That right. black culture is, is not that. Black culture is actually communal, uplifting, That's right. people working together as a community, all of these different pieces. It's capitalism that tells you, you know, step all over everyone no matter what. And that That's lionizes right. people who do that in certain contexts. I That's mean, right. if you're the head of a Wall Street firm, you are a gangster. There's no doubt about it. You're doing more damage all over the world and in the United States than any drug dealer on the planet. In fact, you are the biggest drug dealer. That's right. Let's be right. real. These giant quote unquote cartels, billions of dollars, that's not like some separate business stream. It's 100% integrated into the existing monopoly capitalist reality and the, high, the people who are at the highest possible levels. I mean, just look at how they protected the president of Honduras uh, for all those years mm. in the U.S. government because he was their ally in a right-wing government mm -hmm. that was trying to prevent working class and indigenous and black folks there in that country um, from, from rising That's up right. and changing their thing, even to have a coup in 2009. So we lionize it. When it's the Wolf of Wall Street, when it's Wall Street, the movie of Michael Douglas, mm -hmm. when it's, you know, uh, Succession, which, mm -hmm. you know, another good example of that, billions, all it, like we, we lionize that kind of gangster billionaire stuff on TV and movies, the people themselves, Jeff Bezos, richest guy, Elon Musk. You look at their business practices though, you know, you got people passing out, urinating on themselves, being right. hit by robots right. in, a, in an Amazon warehouse. But nonetheless, we're told to, to lionize and push this first and forward. But when I say it's the, the collision between expectations and opportunity, the reality is, is um, unless you already have a rich parent, you're not gonna become a billionaire. Right. Uh, except maybe one out of you know 99.9999999999 but jeff bezos his dad gave him what like one hundred and twenty thousand dollars and the garage to start amazon in you know the average person of any race but forget black people uh you know are, are going to be in that situation so then you start to think well i've never really seen somebody go from zero to 100 as like the manager at mcdonald's like, I just don't know anyone who was serving fries and who now owns six franchises. But maybe I do know somebody who got out and made a couple moves and was able to go from zero to 100. Yeah, you do. Maybe they ended up locked up. Maybe they ended up dead. But at least they lived mm -hmm. in a way that has dignity. Mm -hmm. And the way I'm told is success. Mm -hmm. And the way that I'm told helps us get women. They say, oh, you know what I mean? That's, like, that's right. what it is. How do you build a family? How do you find a woman? They say, get rich, have money, all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. So then you just, you're modeling what the only opportunities that seem possible to you to achieve the expectations that capitalist society has said, if you don't meet the succession level expectation, you know, that you have, right. have failed. And I, and I think that I don't even really know exactly where I was going with this, but I guess I'll just come to a different Keep point, going. Keep you know? going. And, 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 that, and that is, you know, we have to be serious about revolution. Because if we're not serious go. about it, why would anyone else take us seriously? Bring, and I think sometimes serious. we ourselves are not that serious about it. That's right. And I think it's a lot of people who are claiming to be revolutionaries, radicals, will quote 85,000 Amilcar Cabral quotes who are right now saying vote for Kamala Harris. That's right. You know? That's I mean, right. a lot of them. Actually. Yeah, they are. Um, and and, yeah, and when I are. talk about going back to the point I made in the beginning about Dr. Robert Allen, that's how they perfected it. When I catch a big one on the Whoa. Summer Jam screen, Eugene. Come, Come on, on, Eugene. Come, Come on, on, Eugene. Come I mean, on, Eugene. This, is, this is where this is, is, is where we really have to get deep. I mean, I, I just, I'm going to say some stuff before we get out say of here. It. I mean, get him. Get him. Say it. It. bring it home. Bring why it home. It? Now, I, look, I'm 
100% in favor of moving to a society where people feel like they don't need to hurt other people, where we can have no police, no prisons, no nothing. But obviously, policing and prisons are not random. They're products of class society, inequality, you know, and thousands of years of conditioning in that space. So average working class people who, you know, many of whom hate the police in the black community are going to be thinking like, okay, yeah, I'd like to do this, but what else can we do? So why was it that you had tens of hundreds of millions of dollars sent to organizations whose definition of abolition stopped at the word mm. and who said, we have an abolitionist framework, mm. but the abolitionist framework had nothing to do with capitalism. It's because the reality of the rich billionaire class ruling 1% new, people were so hot, they had to have something that looked revolutionary. That's right. But it had to be something that was easy to contain. And it's hard to contain something cogent, so you come up with something that doesn't really make a lot of sense, that decontextualizes mm. the entire context. You say this is radical and revolutionary, come and you on. capture tens of thousands of people who want to struggle into a system that is 100% created. And then you have, you know, families of police brutality left broke. You got even the, 10 of the Black Lives Matter chapters talking about we broke, even though they raised hundreds of millions of dollars. How did that happen? Yes, you had the thing in the New York Times with the brother who was buying Fendi and flying all over the yes, country. Sir. Like, and all these people were talking about abolition. Asada taught me. We got nothing mm. to lose but our chains. Mm -hmm. All this, that, and the third. So well, that's what I mean when I say let's be serious about revolution. Revolution is when the worst, the masses of people, the working class, the people who own no capital, overthrow the ruling class 1% bourgeoisie yep. and replace a That's system right. that is profit play. above everything. Everything producing capitalism is to make profit, clothes, housing, whatever, and says, we're going to make people first. It's a real system. It's a real movement. And if we're not going to get serious, uh, the actual masses will not take us seriously. It looks like we're play acting. And I think at this stage in the game with this election is a time for us to focus in and to build. And just like in the abolitionist days, all the most hardcore abolitionists, they said, y'all are crazy. You shouldn't get out here. If you have a third party like the Liberty Party, you're going to throw the election to the slave owners, this, that, and the third. All the same stuff they say now about third parties. None of those people saying that about third parties now. Everybody's saying, don't vote for Claudia and Karina. Don't vote for Jill Stein. Don't vote for Cornel West. Don't vote for all these people. All of this, those same people would say, oh, it's so good we ended slavery. And I'm in the tradition of the abolitionist movement, not recognizing those people were the most rebuked, scorned, hated, hunted, imprisoned, killed, price on their head people mm. at mm. That, that, their time. Right. That the only mm -hmm. way they even got accepted into society was when 180,000 black people took up the gun That's right. uh, during the Civil I, War That's and right. forced our humanity on those regardless of what they thought. Make it so ultimately, somebody has to step out now on faith. It's not 2028. It's not next four years. It's not this time vote for Kamala or whatever. We're going to go right back to organizing. At a certain point, you got to draw a line in the sand. Like we're going to build the uncompromising anti-capitalist alternative right now. We're going right. to build the fight back right now so that every single person who's lost faith in everything, and I don't blame them, they lost hope in everything, and I don't blame them, will say, well, look at these crazy Negroes out here uh, doing all this when they don't have to be, when they're being attacked, all these other pieces. Like, if they're doing that, then maybe I should at least look into it. You know, you got to raise people's feeling that you're doing something worth looking into. And I think mm -hmm. that's, that's the important reality. That's why I'm a member of the Party for Socialism and Liberation. That's why I'm supporting this campaign, because I decided a long time ago, you know, if you don't build it, they will never come. That's the reality. That's right. and we, we put too much on the masses of people. And we say people don't understand. They don't see this. Well, what are we giving them to help them see that we're serious about struggling? That's right. Because that's what people want to know. You say you want to mm -hmm. fight. Mm -hmm. Are you willing to really fight? And I think if we can't even say we won't vote against the system, how can we really possibly say that we're going to fight against the system? I mean, it just, it just I wouldn't take it seriously, to be honest with you. That's right. Look, we can shut this thing off right now. Yeah. I mean, I think, look, <laughs> yeah. what to say, what to say? I mean, I think the core point, you know, that our optimism is founded. You know what I mean? It's that our collective courage, our collective power, it's so much, you know, higher than anything that these repressive forces can bring. Uh, when you really study that history, when you really dive in, not just quoting Cabral, but understanding the revolutionary movement and a revolutionary struggle, um, understanding what these movements have done throughout history. Because it's clear that, you know, our position today is not out of a lack of trying. You know, we have definitely waged these
powerful struggles against chattel slavery, against Jim Crow, against continuous police brutality, you know, the taking of our political prisoners, you know, which I think is a major issue that you absolutely never see anywhere in the mainstream media, and especially not from the mouths of a Kamala Harris. Free Kamal Siddiqui, free Jalil al free Mumia Abu Jamal, free Leonard Peltier. There we go. Free Amal. Exactly, exactly. These are the types of discussions that, you know, are, are very powerful, very important for us to have. Um, and I saw people saying, you know, every Tuesday, there has to be a, a revolutionary, you know, church service. Uh, so we'll, we'll think about that, you know, but clearly it's very important to have these types of dialogues. Um, it doesn't end here. I know there's so many questions that are coming up where people are like, what do I do first? What's the first step? What's the last step? What's the next step? Um, but I think it's very powerful and important that we took it to that note of revolution, which clearly is the direction that, you know, this campaign, uh, the Claudia and Karina campaign, but as well as many people's movements are committed to, but it's very important to define that commitment, define what it means to be a revolutionary. And folks, you know, I, I do want to give just one opportunity uh, to, because this is a continuing conversation and y'all are all doing amazing work in your own rights, uh, just to give y'all a second to say how we can follow your work, but also if you have any final comments, just for today, at least, um, the floor is yours. I would love to hear it. We should definitely do this again and and anytime eugene is giving sermons i'm trying to be in the building anyway whether on the panel or in the audience uh and uh and and and, and i was trying to think of a joke for what i what i see how i see hiram uh the kind of sermon he's giving but i'm trying yeah so i i, I like all of this uh and, and and we should do it as often as possible uh for me it's easy i mean add i mix what i like uh, for all social media and and please support black liberation media uh, as a collective uh, ongoing uh, and uh, it's been a pleasure I look forward to, to to more of these thank you all very much this has been great mm. yeah I appreciate one thing thank you all for inviting me one thank everybody who sat on the live everybody who watched the live everybody who's going to share the live um, big shout out to all of you and all of you who are out there doing the work that is necessary I don't have a big social media presence, um, but I am over at my organization, the Community Resource Hub, uh, in our George Jackson School, so you can hit us over there. Um, and from time to time, you may catch me on Black Liberation Media with Dr. Ball, uh, so you can find me over there as well. Mm. Yeah. Well, I just want to say I really appreciate this. Shout out to everybody. I saw a few people asking in the comments if this will be posted somewhere else. I, you know, if this doesn't happen, I apologize. But I think I heard earlier it is going to go on YouTube. So uh, the Vote Socialist 2024 campaign YouTube, I think, is going to put it up or maybe the PSL YouTube. But we'll try to, you know, put that out so people see. So definitely you will be able to share this in a lot of different ways. Um, you can find me at Eugene per year on Twitter. That's my own little, only social media. Um, you know, some people know me and my journalism. Okay, it will be posted on YouTube. I saw that confirmed. Um, Breakthrough News, you can find us at BT Newsroom across all the platforms. Please support Black Liberation Media. Please buy the, the myth and propaganda of Black buying power. Please support the Community Resource Hub. Like, even if you just give $2 a month, like, we all do it. So you, you, you don't see it. You think like, damn, all I got is $2 a month for these brothers. Like it doesn't, that, that's not gonna make any difference. But if the tens of thousands of people who follow us and like us, were just giving one, $2 a month, we would be having hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars to work with. So even if you got 50 cents, you know, log on to one of these organizations you've heard and like donate and don't just donate one time, set up a recurring monthly donation. Cause that's how you can build a base and build a foundation to really grow our networks, grow our projects and do those different pieces. So it's out there. Um, so I just really wanted to make that plug to people that like even small amounts of money, we can be transformative in what we do. So, you know, that's it. I really appreciate it. Vote Claudia and Karina 2024. That's step one. Step two, then get your donation links uh, ready to go. Uh, and step three, we'll keep talking about that in the next chapter. Um, so thanks to everybody. And I appreciate you, Cam, um, for, for hosting us on this. And definitely, definitely want to say, you, go out, get this book with the forward by Eugene for, per year. Okay, the Black yeah. Belt thesis. The you get an 1804 sharp. books, 1804.com.org, I think, over at the People's Forum. They got everything you need over there. Go pick that up. There we go. My copy's over there, but I would bring it over too. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, I got really appreciate mine too. Uh, actually, we got to we got to build on that. I actually, yeah, we got to build on that. But anyway, yes, yeah. Time Thank to you, build. Everybody. Time to build.
But folks, thank you so much. Really appreciate anyone who's still on. You know, we still got a large number of people. So appreciate you listening through this whole thing. Uh, catch up when you see it posted. You know, go back and see what you missed. Uh, but so many more discussions are going to be coming up. Not only up until November 5th, but long after that, you know, because we have a huge task ahead of us. I think that is clear from today's discussion, and we are fit for that task. We are ready, uh, but we just got to keep building, keep training, and keep fighting. So that's what we're going to do, folks. Um, of course, if you are watching this and you're already following Claudia Karina 2024, excellent. Uh, go ahead and check out votesocialist2024.com. Uh, very powerful message up there, and it's important that we have this discussion right now. Absolutely, and we will continue having them in the future. So, thank you, everybody, and good night. Till we win, appreciate y'all. Peace. Good night, folks. Peace. We delay.